uh, Pengali's name? Dave and Fran? Hey? Oh, it's his. <laughs> Immortalized. Okay. Back to Stacy, September 27, 2000, at the WCB TV studios in Brandon, Manitoba. Can you tell me your name and what your rank was? Well, my name is Jack Stacy, and I was discharged with the rank of flying officer. Where did you grow up, Jack? On, mostly on Vancouver Island in BC. And North, uh, the last few years was at a little place called Kelsey Bay. What did your family do? My uh, father was in the railroad business here um, with logging railroads. He was an engineer. And uh, the war started in 1939, of course, and I was only 15. And there was a labor shortage. And I was firing steam locomotive at the age of 15 trying to do my high school co by correspondence because there was no high schools up there. And uh, of course, when I turned 18, I wanted to enlist in the Navy. That was my first choice. And when I did turn 18 and applied to the Navy, they were overbooked. There was no places left. They said, go home and wait. I went home and I waited and waited and finally I decided I better get in and do something. So in 1943, in October, I joined the Royal Canadian Air Force in Vancouver. Do you have any family members who served for the Air Force? I, no, I, uh, in our family, I was the oldest, and, uh, but I had two cousins that were in the Air Force. Do you have any idea what you were getting into? No, <laughs> I think uh, being 18 years old and anxious to get going, you didn't think of too many things. The war was on. The Germans were sinking ships in the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and the Japanese were shelling the west coast of Vancouver Island from submarines. So things were a little exciting at that time. So which manning depot did you go to then? From Vancouver, I went to Edmonton, which was number three manning depot. And uh, basic training there. They inoculated you for different diseases and outfitted you in uniforms, and which were always too big, and uh, marched. I spent six weeks there at Manning Depot in Edmonton. And then uh, in the early part of December, I got shipped to um, Gimli, Manitoba, to do some tarmac duty, waiting for a, an opening at a bombing and gunnery school. The and weather was a big adjustment. It certainly was. When I got off the train in Winnipeg there, we had to wait two hours. We thought we'd wander down Main Street. I didn't stay out there too long. It was the mm -hmm. first time I'd ever witnessed minus 20 degrees, or 20 below Fahrenheit. <laughs> so how long were you in Gimli? Just till uh, just after Christmas. In January, uh, I got a posting to number three bombing and gunnery school, which is at the McDonald's, Manitoba, just north of Portage. Uh, let's go back to Manning Depot for a minute. Uh, uh, did you find it a huge adjustment there? Uh, I'm thinking of the numbers of men that you had to suddenly share quarters with. Not so much at that time. Not until I got to gunnery school did I run into any Australians and New Zealand. But there was a, quite a few of them. But the Canadians were the vast majority. As during the plan, I guess you've done all this before. Uh, during the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, they uh, trained 100, over 131,000 air crew. That didn't include the ground crew, but air crew alone. And 72,000 of them were Canadians, so the rest came from England, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. And at Manning Depot, um, what was the average day of life? What did you spend your day doing? 
it seemed like we were marching all, marching, marching, marching. <laughs> drill, 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 drill. And uh, they uh, put us through a little questionnaire uh, test to find out which part of the air, which air crew you would go to. And what, they don't ask you what you preferred. Of course, everybody wanted to be a pilot and fly. But most bomber crews were consisted of seven people. So. Did you know then when you left Manning Depot what you would be doing? E, yes, I knew I was heading for the gun, bombing and gunnery schools. Um, did you get any recreation time when you were in Edmonton? Could you go no. Uh, I often remember my dad writing a letter to me and saying, every time I get a letter from you, you're heading farther and farther east. Because I enlisted in Vancouver, I went to Edmonton, and then to Gimli, Manitoba. But I did get a Christmas leave in 1943, the winter of 43, and uh, a week to get all the way across to BC and up the island, and back into back to Gimli within that week. And you made it. I was mostly traveling, but I had spent managed to spend two days at home. Certainly wasn't like mothers, <laughs> but uh, it it kept us alive. Yeah. Um, so when you got to Kimley, you were doing guard duty. Yeah, well, there was uh, maintenance on on uh, Gimli Airfield. Yeah. I was helping a pipe fitter change some gas pipelines at the pumps where they filled up the aircraft. With. A po uh, an opening at the Bombing and Gunnery School. So when did you arrive at, at Bombing and Gunnery School? Mid-January. Of 1944. And it was where? At uh, McDonald's, north of Portage, north and west of Britain. Number three Bombing and Gunnery School. It doesn't exist anymore there. So, what were your courses? Very interesting. Consisted mostly of uh, aircraft identification, and um, they had the two types of aircraft there when I when I was going through the Bowling Brook, which is a twin-engine aircraft, and the Lysander, which towed the targets, the drogues, for us. Tell us what a drogue is. A drogue is a canvas bag, more or less. They had lots of them. And uh, each time a, a gunner went up, and two of us went up at a time in these bowling brooks, and we took our turns. But we all had a different belt of ammunition, and they had colors on them. The bullets had colors, red, black, yellow, black, blue, whatever. You were assigned a color. And when that drogue came back down, they counted all the blue marks or the red marks or the yellow marks in it to see how you, you did. I, apparently, I did all right. I got fairly good marks. There was 60 of us in the class, and and um, the top 20 were uh, commissioned. That's the first, like a flying officer. Not a flying officer, a pilot officer. That was the first rank. But most of them before that had graduated as sergeants and flight sergeants. Yes, it was very interesting. But I think the last flight there at McDonald's was not the memorable one. Well, we crashed and you know, on the field, taking off. You know, I don't know what happened that day. The pilot somehow was 60 feet in the air halfway down the runway when everybody had been using the full length. And uh, both engines stalled. And we came down and ground looped off the runway into the grass. and. One undercarriage went up through an engine, and the engine fell off. We bounced around quite a bit, so that was uh, the last time I was in a bowling, a bowling book, as we, a bowling, as we call it. The uh, one thing I remember well was that they knew we'd crashed, and the crash tender and the ambulance was out there immediately, and uh, we climbed out through the hat top hatch and jumped down onto the ground. 
and the medical officer, the first aid people, felt us all over. And we were bruised, but no broken bones or anything. And he said, take him away. And McDonald and I wondered, where are we going? We haven't done anything. And uh, so they took us immediately to the takeoff area where a bunch of air gunners were waiting to go up. They pulled two guys out of the first one that was ready to go and put us in. And uh, we flew right over the wreck. And I found out after they did that because if we went back to the barracks and stewed about it for a while, we'd say, enough of that, we're not, you know, we're quitting. And uh, get what they used to call L LMF, lack of moral fiber, and wasted all that training time. So they'd uh, immediately take us up again and get rid of that fear. It had uh, been, been in four months, time. yes. It was in in uh, May, early part of May. And uh, one thing I remember about it, I don't know, maybe to this day it, it might have been a good omen, but they kept us back after graduation because they were investigating that crash. And when they finally got around to it, which was a month later, uh, interviewed us. and you know, asked us if the pilot went through the complete cockpit check and, and we said yes, yes. But, um, and as a result, that pilot lost his wings and he was converted back to a ground crew. But that month, all the other, our graduates had gone their ways and gone overseas and I figured, well, if we hadn't been in that accident, we would have been over there. But then again, I might have been a statistic, one of the statistics. Uh, it seems to me there's a lot of teamwork that has to happen, and uh, uh, a crash might be one person's responsibility, or perhaps everyone in the group has to take responsibility, and, and you would maybe never know, would you, how you exactly wouldn't know. a crash comes about. Yeah. And training it was completely different than what it was like overseas on actual uh, Do you remember uh, seeing uh, the gun turret for the first time and wondering how you were going to fit in it? <laughs> That's right. Uh, they uh, took us through a bowling brook and said, this is the plane that you're going to be used to train. This is the turret. And it was sure cramped. And this is the hatch in case you have to jump with the parachute. Your parachutes are hanging over here on the fuselage. And our equipment was a harness that we wore all the time. And if we were going to jump, we'd have to take the chute off of there and hook it on two clips on the harness. And he says, you go out through that hole. And we looked at the hole and said, how on earth can we get out of there with a parachute on? And the instructor said, don't you worry. If it's a matter of life and death, you'll get through that hole. <laughs> so. No, thank goodness. Did you go to a wireless school too? No, we took yeah. uh, some wireless training at, at the, the ball uh, ball yeah. Uh, what was learning Morse code like? Uh, very, uh, very, well, I would say um, scary sometimes because you, uh, the did out, did out, did out, did did dash. I used to know the complete alphabet, but I forgot it now. It's been so long ago. Complex. Yeah. yeah. And also the fairy, the um, lights, the flashing lights. The Altus lamp, they called it. You'd have to read the Morse code through the Altus lamp, which is a short burp and a long one, a short and long, and that's how they. We took a lot of that, plus, of course, of gunnery. We learned to take a Browning machine gun apart, blindfold it, and put it back together again. Um, did you do both courses at the same time, or did yes. you constantly do it? So each day would bring classroom work. That's and right. Then going up in the planes. That's right. Yeah. And uh, every day it was aircraft identification.
they flash images on the screen and you'd have to identify them. Quick as you can. Yeah. Uh, what were your instructors like? Did they stick out in your mind? Go ahead. They're average, normal people. Some of them had been overseas and back again, had done their tour of duty and were back training and used as training people. So their experience was very good to the rest of us rookies. No, I never saw any civilian. Only a dentist. He might have been a civilian. Um, must have been cold up in the planes. Did, did equipment jam because of the cold? Yeah, we had um, a heater that blew hot air from the engines in into the fuselage, which helped considerably. But we were well dressed at at training during training. That is, it was a little different when we got overseas. How did the men feel? How was morale? Um, I would imagine you'd hear stories about what was happening overseas and, uh, and be trying to imagine when you yourself would be going. Were, in general, the men excited about, about heading over? Yes. Um, I think the majority of us were anxious to get over there and get the job done. I had an interesting story. I, while I was waiting for a train in Vancouver to go to Edmonton, I visited my grandfather. He lived in Vancouver, my grandparents on my dad's side. And Grandpa Stacy had been in the First World War. And uh, he was a survivor of Vimy Ridge, which that's in history right now is what made Canada, Canada. And um, he told me, he says, son, he says, you're going to see an awful lot of destruction, noise, and you're going to see your friends die right in front of you, injured, you know. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah. But being 18 years old, I, um, and I didn't think too much of it until I got over there and witnessed it myself. And then I thought, oh, Grandpa was right, quite right. Or we used to go to Portage until they put Portage out of bounds because we we're making too much of a racket and in town. The townspeople were getting a little annoyed at the uh, at what the air crew, so they made Portage out of bounds to us. So uh, when we did get a, a 48, as we called it, a, a weekend leave, most of us headed for Winnipeg and headed for the dance spots. And Until uh, June, but that that month we had to wait around and we just weren't doing anything yeah. after we graduated in May. What was graduation like? Uh, the the uh, CO was commanding officer uh, number three. Was a great arm, uh, army man sort of too, and he always liked that uh, one song. There's something about a soldier that is fine, 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 and every time there was graduation, that's what he had the orchestra play. I can remember marching up and uh, him pinning the wing on my chest and you would step back and salute and then make the boat turn and walk back to the file ranks again. And uh, there's 60 of us to do that and standing there for until 60 got their wings pinned on them was uh, quite <laughs> stressful to say the least. But then we were happy to get back to barracks. And were you able to celebrate afterwards? Oh, there's always celebration going on in those days. <laughs> uh, any other memories of, of training? Oh. Anything stand out? Other, other than that accident, and, and uh, of course you meet, meet an auto. People too, and you, you, the um, 
air gunner that was with me in that crash, McDonald, he was from Calgary. And uh, we used to go on leaves together. But then we got uh, posted overseas and lost track of one another. He went one way and I went the other, two different squadrons and that. Uh, and I haven't seen him since. But uh, training, training, it all happened very quickly. It just seems that in October when I enlisted till August when we got posted to Lachine to wait for an overseas, to get overseas, it didn't seem like um, 10 months or 11 months. It just went by so fast. So many things happening. And the long train rides back and forth between stations and going home on leave was uh, the boring. I think I went across Canada twice on both railroads, from coast to coast. Oh, both railroads, anyway. How long did that take? Well, it was two days from Winnipeg and three days, five days. And the last time, when we got home from overseas, uh, I left Vancouver, and it was six days before I got to Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, where we were to convert onto a different bomber. This is after VE Day. Um, so, after graduation, you were in McDonald's for another month? During that investigation, yeah. And then you traveled to where? Well, to Calgary. Um, uh, I, thought I should have brought those pictures. Uh, it's a postgraduate course. They, they put us through, where we um, basically learned to, uh, if we'd get forced down behind enemy lines, how to get out and, and things like that. They made us crawl on our bellies just like a soldier would with a rifle in our hands and backpack on and climb over fences and climb and take us away out into the prairies and tell us to get back to the station. We didn't know where we are. We had to get back, uh, things like that that training. But the memorable part about that, it was in the first part of July, and the Calgary Stampede was on, so we were very fortunate to take in the Calgary Stampede at the same time. Fortunate. Plus, it was summer, so you wouldn't have been trying to find your way back in the cold. No, right. <laughs> I got the, one of the best tans I ever got in my life. Not at that time, no. Not One of us had, uh, the, the, uh, the, each uh, groups of six or seven had uh, had one map. That was in Calgary. But it was a little different overseas. So how long were you in Calgary? Just uh, two weeks. Two weeks. So two weeks of intense training yeah. to get you ready. And then you headed east? They give us a week's leave at home and um, we headed east through Lachine, which was just outside of Montreal, where we w awaited for, I guess, a ship of some sort to take us over seas, and we waited there three weeks. It was well into August, anyway, when they put us on board a train, and we didn't know where we were heading, whether we were heading to Quebec City, to Halifax, or where, but we wound up in New York. And uh, I can remember getting off the train and looking across the Hudson River there, three huge liners, and two of them were the Queen, Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth. We thought, oh boy, we're going to hit one of the queens. But the ferry that took us across from the railroad station over to the docks headed for the Martinia. It's a smaller ship, but it was a, a cruise ship that was converted to a troop ship during the war. And that's the boat we went on. How many? Any idea? How many? There was about 4,000 of us on that cramped up in there. And most of you seasick. <laughs> By the time we got out into the North Sea, and uh, of course that boat, they 
it was fast, too fast for a convoy. Like there was, there wasn't a convoy that we were in. It was by itself, and they zigged and zagged across the sea. The, the idea was to that the German submarines couldn't get a good beat on us. But then it stormed as well. So we're zigging and zagging and up and down and around. And I guess the, a lot of the guys were couldn't stand that and were seasick. I think I must have been 3,000 of them sick. There was a sorry looking bunch of people by the time we got to Liverpool. <laughs> Well, I was getting a little woozy, but the first few days out, everybody was crowding and lining up to get to the mess hall and eat. We had, they gave us two meals a day, breakfast and supper, and that was it on board. And uh, the third day, the lineup uh, decreased somewhat. By the fourth day, you could walk down and get it wherever you wanted. <laughs> Most of them were too sick to get down and eat, and they couldn't even think of the thought of food. But yet they had these drills where we had to dash out off on the deck and stand there about five or four deep up against the wall. And it's usually the guy behind it would feel sick and he'd head for the railing. But uh, that was a horrible, <laughs> horrible trip. And I don't know how I stood it, but there's a few of us that came from the West Coast and were used to sea, sea travel. Just a duffel bag with your change of clothes and your underwear and a few things like pictures, home pictures and, and that, and your shaving equipment, your, your, your kit, right? Yeah, and that Contact was about it. From home would be the occasional letter? Yes. Oh, yes. Send the occasional letter, and that would be it. Yes, but all the letters were... Uh, censored. So we had to be careful what we were and where we were and what was going on. So you didn't seal up your letter, then you would pass it on to your Yeah. Letter. It would be sealed after it went through the interrogation. So you got to Liverpool. Yes, and uh, the boat couldn't dock. So they had to take us off the make it Mortania into smaller boats and take us because the main docks were all bombed out. And the railroad station had been bombed. And uh, we had to walk through this, the old station, walk around twisted steel and piles of brick and concrete. We had to walk about a mile lugging our stuff to get to the train. And got on the train and we were still didn't, weren't were doubtful as to where we were going. We wound up in London but with the orders to catch such and such a train in two hours' time. So we had a, a chance to see a little bit of London and the destruction that went on there through the Blitz. There were still remains of a lot of bombed out buildings around. Right. This would have been August of 44. That's September. September. Yeah, first part of September. And uh, we wound up in Bournemouth, which is on the south coast which is a, a disembarkation leave, they called it, for a week to get the guys back, <laughs> their land legs back again after, you know, and if they'd been sick, let them recuperate a bit. And then we were shipped off to a, a station up north in Yorkshire where we were crewed up, where um, you could crewed up with a pilot, the navigator, bomb aimer, wireless operator, and the gunners, and, uh, and what have you. And that's when the six of us got together initially and went to uh, Worksop, which is an operational training unit. And we were training in Wellingtons. We used to call them the Wimpies. But it was a twin engine with just one turret on it in the back. So we'd take turns at uh, sitting in the turret. But that, uh, that lasted for uh, um, two or three months. We spent Christmas at Worksop. And then in January 45, we went up to what we call conversion unit in Doncaster. 
and uh, it's a uh, where you convert from a twin engine aircraft to a four engine aircraft. And we were in Halifax. Hmm? What's it like to adapt to these various airplanes? Was the Wellington quite different from? from well, yes, it's a. Uh, the turret was different. It was a fraternized turret. Where the Halifax bomber that we wound up in uh, had Fraser Nash, or had Bolton Paul turrets. So, you know, you had to get adjusted to that. And, and the pilot had to get used to flying uh, from a Wellington to a Halifax. It was quite different. So you spend a, we spent about a month there. And then we waited. For, we got a week's leave and uh, wound up on with 432 Squadron, the Lee side Squadron, the Eastmore. No. No. Not at all. No. But it was a Canadian. Yes. Squadron. It's six group, which was all Canadian. So you were now based where? At Eastmore. Eastmore. Which is in Yorkshire, and north, about seven miles north of the city of York. Well, they, they send us out on what they call cross countries, um, just to keep us exercised, like, and then, and then our first missions in April. See, we, we got in rather late, and we didn't com have a complete tour. We only did five operations, five actual operations, and one of them, we had to turn back because the army was there ahead of us. So we had to turn around and come back with, a, with our bomb load. Which one was that? Venom. One of your last, one of your last operations? Yeah, yeah, the last one. Because we knew, you knew the end was coming. It was inevitable. Because the army was going so fast across Germany, they were the, beating us to the targets. And Do you remember your first operation? Very well. I was a spare gunner. Every uh, every cruise, every operation, uh, the trucks would take dump the crews off at the various holding places where the bombers were kept. Somebody had to go along as a spare in case somebody got sick or or something happened or missed. And um, I was a spare gunner. This is my first, very first operation, and. Uh, this guy jumped out of the tail off the tailgate, and his ring caught in the hook on the tailgate of the truck, tore his finger right off. And he was on the ground there looking for his finger. He picked it up and he tried to put it back on again, and he passed out. But there's no time, you know. The it's a, the crew had to get off. Away I went with that crew, a strange crew. <laughs> at keel, keel uh, the shipyards at, uh, and docks at keel on the north north end of Germany was our target that night. It's pitch black. So you dropped bombs and you turned? Yes. Yeah. Uh, a gunner's responsibility was to keep an eye open for other aircraft and for flak right. and for search lights to avoid the we'd tell the pilot, you know, the search lights were coming up on our starboard side or port side and alter course. And so they couldn't get a, a line on us. And the same with the uh, concentrated flak. You could see the puffs of um, exploding shells coming up. And you'd tell a pilot to corkscrew port or starboard, and he'd do it right away. And uh, these puffs go on by. And we had to watch for our own aircraft, too, because it was, you know, 500 to 1,000 aircraft up in the air there. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. What kind of plane were you in then? Halifax. Halifax. Yeah. Which isn't what you were trained on, or no, not at all? Yes. You did. Well, uh, from Doncaster, we were converted from the Wellington to the, to the Halifax. Halifax. It's a four engine bomber, Mark III. So, how many crew were in Halifax? Seven. 
seven of us. So, um, what was what was life like in between operations? Played bridge. I, we all stayed in the same hut, when this hut, steel huts, and um, waited for the call. And you had to be ready. Most of our operations were at night with the RAF and the RCAF until the last few, the last two operations that we did were daylight operations. And you see more, you see a lot more. Yes, the odd, yeah. How did, uh, how did the locals receive you? What did they think of the Canadians? They were very good. Like when we went to Bournemouth for this um, um, leave after we got off the ship, the uh, British, uh, the families would invite you out, airmen out, to stay with them for three and four days at a time. And, I happened to, to get picked uh, by a, a retired admiral, Admiral Farr. He was about 75, 80 years old, and his wife was quite a bit younger. But I stayed with them for four days, and they were very good, very good. It was, that was my experience anyway. They asked, my, uh, they said, Do I, they, they understood that Canadians like corn on the cob. And I said, oh yeah, well, I had visions. Oh, corn on the cob. We never got that. I haven't seen that for a long time, over a year. And uh, sat down at the table, and they had this plate of corn and, and a jar of syrup. And uh, it was raw. And I guess that's the way they ate it. They didn't realize that you boiled the corn, you know, and softened it up. So it was completely raw. I had quite. I didn't want to hurt their feelings, so I ate it anyway. I chawed, chewed through it. They didn't have any. <laughs> um, but and with the rationing at the time, that yes. would have been quite Right, yeah. Things. Yeah. They had to sacrifice their own, their own rations to feed us. So how long were you there until, uh, until the war ended? Yeah, May the 8th. Um, well, we knew days before that the, the messes were pretty busy. The wet, <laughs> wet canteens, as we call them, and nothing else to do. So uh, the commanding officer of our station, anyway, had uh, the mechanics go around and take the mags out of all the aircraft. Uh, they were afraid maybe somebody might decide to go home early and take a bomber with them. So there wasn't any aircraft that was operational. And then after, after the uh, celebrations of the E-Day, I dismantled the squadrons. And since we had only four, four and a half, five operations under our, the whole, our whole crew volunteered for the South Pacific because the, the Japanese war was still on. And um, so we, we got shipped home early. We, we got home in June for a month's leave. And uh, we were supposed to go to Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, where we'd convert onto an uh, improved model of the uh, Lancaster bomber, which was uh, a big improvement on the, the Lancaster. They called them the Lincolns. And that's what we were going to use to go down to the South Pacific and fight the Japanese. How were they in improvement? Uh, faster, they could fly higher, and have a bigger bomb load. So the, the technology was improving all the time? All the time. So you were supposed to go? I got down to Yarmouth, and two days after, I was the f one of the first of our crew to get back there. They dropped the bomb on Hiroshima, and that was it. I was shipped back to Winnipeg, and that's where I got my discharge.
in September. Well, yes, yes. Yeah. And did it sink in that maybe this was the end of Oh, yeah. It was just a matter of days. It was all on the newscasts and radio and newspapers. Uh, your squadron, um, everyone make a plan? Yes. Oh, uh, oh, I don't, oh, I don't know about the squadron, but all our crew, oh, yeah. our crew. Yeah. We're off we're on the boat. Um, we came back on the Ile de France and then in Hel Halifax on the famous Pier 21. And it was the Ile de France, and uh, we were coming into the harbor, and the captain was trying to steer the boat in. And uh, he warned everybody, please stay where you are on board. But there was some girls up on the roof of this big shed and of course all everybody on board there was about <laughs> four thousand of us all dashed over to that side of the ship and it tilted the ship and he lost control of it <laughs> in mist and we had to make another turn to get back in there this this time we stayed where we were we let kept the ship level <laughs> No, not too many. No. I I had a lot of uh, poor experience there. Um, I had a trunk, and I had picked up a lot of souvenirs overseas. My logbook was in it, and uh, pictures and different things I'd picked up for gifts and what have you, and my best uniform. And when I was up on the deck saying waving goodbye to the rest of the crew. And I went down to pick up my stuff, and uh, the suitcase was gone. And I looked all high and low for it, and I couldn't find it anywhere. But I found out after that the crew members used to take and, you know, and steal them, and take the souvenirs, like, you know. Yes, I had two films ready to develop. I had a little wee camera and I took some good pictures of our bombing raid over Leipzig. It was a daylight operation and I quickly took a couple of pictures of some of our aircraft going down, exploding out of control. And uh, I didn't want to get them developed over there because I wasn't supposed to take pictures like that. But, um, and all I saw five five of our aircraft go down in blames, you know, with no survivors. And that stays in my mind. I remember those to this day. That's why I say if if uh, if I'd been with the rest of them, I might have been a statistic when you know, I had to stay back in McDonald there for that extra month. Because, as, as the saying goes, you know, one in four aircrew lost their lives during that time. So a group of 60, you know, 15 of them would be gone in our class, 60. No, I think it was very thorough, the uh, training program for the various trades, very thorough. Thor thorough enough that uh, we, you know, accomplished what they were supposed to do. So you got to Winnipeg, and what happened next? Discharge. So you On September the 11th, 1945. Mm -hmm. Well, I was engaged 
when I was in training at McDonald's, I got engaged to a girl from Winnipeg, and um, and I read it after the war, after this, I was discharged, we got married. I guess that'd be 55 years ago now. But uh, my first wife passed away in 1975. I remarried Pam, who saved my life a few times. There was, uh, after we got married, we went right out to BC, out to Kelsey Bay, where uh, I was working with the logging, camp, the logging company there. And they said they'd find me a job, and they did. And uh, it was going along fine until there was a lot of labor unrest. There were strikes, strikes, strikes all over the place. And my wife's mother was going through some serious operations, and so we came back to Winnipeg, and uh, I got work with the railroads in Winnipeg for the winter of 46, 45, 46. Wait a minute. Yeah, 46. And uh, working the spare board and wasn't, I had, was married and wasn't, uh, the woman getting one day a week work, couldn't live on that. So I started with the Manitoba telephone system in 1947 and I stayed with him right up until 1982 when I retired. So just as it was a big adjustment to, to um, Air Force life, was it a hard adjustment back into civilian life, or were you quite happy to be there? Well, yes, I was quite happy to get out, because the traveling on trains back and forth, and there was an excess of air crew. I would have liked to have stayed with the Air Force, maybe. But if I, I would have had to take a demotion and start all over again, and I didn't feel like that. But if I had to do over again, I would have missed, would have missed if there was another war. But I hope there isn't. I'll ask you a hard question. If you can't answer it, it's okay. Is there a highlight to your service when you think back of all you did? What, what was the best of it? What, what did you enjoy the most? What did I enjoy the most? I guess it was getting back down to the ground and being sort of dumbfounded with the sudden silence and the, you know, good old terra firma. Uh, I bet the thrill never wore off, did it? Of no. And did it ever become routine? Probably not. Eh? The fear is always present when you're up there. Is it? Mm -hmm. um, I'm imagining going up there again and again. Did you ever get used to it? Or was there always fear in the back of your mind? In you know it up in today's uh, standards or uh, then? Then, then we had uh, all the confidence in each other, and we had a lot of confidence in our pilot, the skipper would call him. He he was excellent, and we trusted him. And uh, I guess that trust helps a lot. We knew. Pep would get us down. Pepper, Sam Pepper was his name. He'd get us down. And we had a lot of confidence in Senator Navigator, too. We knew Lloyd would get us back. And he always did. Then we had a lot of confidence in our bomb aimer. Because uh, when our two daylight operations, we saw how good he was. And we got good marks in, you know, in practice. They used to send up, uh, at conversion unit, they used to send up a a Spitfire pilot or a hurricane pilot who just learning the ropes. And instead of guns, we had infrared cameras in our turrets, and, and uh, the Spitfires and the Hurricanes had infrared cameras in place of guns with them. So when everybody got back down to the ground, you could see how well we did. 
And I always claim I managed to shoot down a, a hurricane. <laughs> but um, we had confidence in one another. We, you know, we stayed as a crew. And to this day, we communicate back and forth. And well, any of us that's left. All over the country. Yes, from Nova Scotia through to Vancouver. So. When's the last time you saw any of them? You just um, last month. Uh, Bomb Aimer Cameron. He he was with a seniors tour from Ottawa, and they were touring different parts of the. Of Manitoba, going up the Riding Mountain National Park, so he gave me a, a ring, and uh, he'd heard about the Commonwealth Air Training Plan Museum, so I, I took him up there and gave him a personal tour of our museum, and we send cards back and forth every Christmas, as I say, the ones that are left. But you know, right after the war, we kept in touch with one another pretty good. When stamps were three cents a piece, and five cents. Oh, things have changed. Yeah. Well, thank you for talking. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Ah. Oh. Oh, that's right. You'll uh, I'm Pam Stacy. I was born Pam Heath, and I was born in Essex in England. And did you grow up in Essex? Well, yes, until the war. Um, Essex, where, where I grew up, it was a seaside town. And it was uh, right on the, the coast, and we lived very close to the beach. And so during the war, we evacuated and went back and evacuated and went back. So I would say during the war years, we were of no fixed abode. <laughs> wow. You moved back and forth. So you would move into London? No, no. Uh, we, would, we were on a direct route um, for bombers coming down from France, over from France. And uh, if the danger of war became imminent, which it did several times, then we'd have to evacuate. Uh, we were given 48 hours to get out. And that way we were allowed to take a few possessions and our dogs. Uh, if we'd refused to go then, um, I think when they figured that it was 24 hours away, we'd just been kicked out with whatever we had, so. So no matter what, you had to go, you couldn't opt to stay, stay. No. 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 Most, most of our area had, had uh, evacuated willingly. Um, there were very few children, very few families, and there were no, no vehicles. Our, our vehicles were all uh, up on blocks with the carburetor, carburetor taken out so that they couldn't be used if the Germans landed. So, so when, the, when the call came, would they load you up in trucks? No, no. no. You went by train. By or train. The trains were, uh, were running the whole time. Um, uh, everything was blacked out. If you were traveling by train, it was dark. There were no lights in the trains. You had to grope your way in and grope your way out. And of course, the houses were all blacked out. And, and you had uh, air raid wardens who were civilians who would walk around uh, checking to see if you had a chink of light showing anywhere. And they would be quite uh, vocal in their orders to uh, shut out the blankety, blankety, blankety lights. It's very, very dim several years. How old were you at the time? How old were you when the war started? I was just turned eight. I turned eight in August and the war started in September. So 
they would load you on the trains? They wouldn't. They would just say, go. So you gather up what you could carry, get on the trains, find somewhere to go. How many in your family? Well, it was just my mother and me because uh, my rest of the family was away doing something for the war effort. So. And your father served? No, my father had been a merchant seaman as this was his, uh, his normal work. But uh, he was... Well, he was about 60 when the war broke out, so he um, was not allowed. He had to give up his merchant seaman thing. He was too old. So he went to work in a, a naffy canteen, went to run one. And the naffy was N-A-A-F-I, Navy, Army, and Air Force Institute. And they had uh, canteens that they ran specifically for the, the servicemen. So my father went off. I don't know where he went. He just went to manage one of these. Was he able to come back and forth, or, or did, did I don't remember not? seeing him. Mm. No, I don't remember seeing him. Most pretty well all the war. And then my I had two brothers. One was in the navy, and one was in the air force and two sisters, and one was in the Wrens, which is the women's um, navy, the women, women's section, and one was in the WAFs, which was the women's army. But they were considerably older than you. Yes, I, I was kind of the after the thought. What did each of them do specifically, your sisters? You know, I don't really know. The, the war is, was such a strange time. There, there wasn't any family life where, where you got to, to visit. It, it was probably different for people over here in the war, but over there it was survival. And I don't remember seeing any of them very often. The only one who went overseas was my oldest brother in the Air Force, and he went to India, and he his um, civilian role was a chef, so he got to India and he just cooked. I don't know whether it was curries or whether it was <laughs> sausage and mash. Um, so, being a young child, you were raised by I think I had a general understanding of it. Um, it. It just, after the first time, it just became a way of life. Okay, we've got to go again. And uh, we had different aunts staying in different parts of the country. And we'd go to one for a while, and then things would ease up a bit, and we'd go home, and then we'd evacuate again, and then we'd go home. And very, very nomadic life, I guess you could say. And this continued throughout the war? This was regular procedure? Pretty well, yes. Um, what about school then? School was a very, very, very odd thing. Um, there were only a very few children left. We, it, it's difficult in England. You don't have a town or a city and then space and then another one it tends to kind of all spread into one. But uh, the general area where I lived, there was only a handful of children. Most children at the beginning of the war were evacuated. Some went up north where it was safer, some went overseas, and I wanted desperately to be evacuated. And to this day, I still have this yearning to have a tag, a tag on my coat which is Pam Heath, and be an evacuee. It's, it's kind of a childhood dream that never materialized. But Where do you think you would have gone and, and ended up with the I have no idea. It just seemed to me like a highly preferable adventure to what the one I was doing. But because there were only a handful, when, when we were back there, um, 